Hello and welcome to the Women Veterans Alliance webinar. I'm Melissa Washington. I am the CEO and founder of Women Veterans Alliance. And um, if you're not familiar with our organization, uh, we are a nationwide organization and our primary focus is to connect women veterans with each other. And we do that through our online and in-person networking and events. So thank you for being here. Um, if you haven't seen, uh, we've got some things coming up um, in right before Women Veterans Recognition Day, which is June 12th, a couple of things. Um, if you haven't voted yet, we do have a logo competition um, for Women Veterans Recognition Day logo that's gonna be put onto um, shirts as well as different items. So it definitely, you can visit our website to vote. And we also have a 50% off sale, um, all of our different um, clothing, jewelry, everything except for our books and our $5 um, items. We also do have branch specific um, items as well. So you definitely want to check out our store as the sale ends June 12th. If you're not um, already following us on social media, please do so and especially subscribe to our YouTube channel as this webinar as well as our previous webinars are um, uploaded to YouTube as well. Again, our store um, also too, we provide um, business and career coaching, and we also have the only online directory for women veteran-owned businesses, so definitely visit our website. We've got a lot of great information, and also too, if you're interested in becoming a member, um, you can find out more information on our website. So we've got coming up um, for the rest of May, uh, we've got uh, next week, why movement in menopause is so important. And then following that, we have microcurrent to resolve chronic pain and disease. And then ending the month, we have who's writing your story. So as you see, we've got a bunch of different uh, webinars coming up. And if you, again, talked, I already talked about Women Veterans Recognition Day um, here in the greater Sacramento area where I'm at, we are going to be having in honor of that, uh, our fun run and parade on June 17th. And we are also having our summer soiree uh, where we will be celebrating military women. And if you haven't heard, or if you've heard, uh, the Women Veterans Unconference, September 8th through the 10th, definitely want to get your tickets now. It's an amazing event um, that will take place at the Tropicana Resort from Friday to Sunday. Um, and you can either scan the QR code or visit womenveteransunconference.com. It's a, a not miss event. Uh, also too early this year, we launched veteran.events where we have uh, events not only our events, but all kinds of other events on our calendar, as well as we have a speaker directory and we have a listing of all the women veteran conferences taking place throughout the US. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Shannon and she is an Agala Advanced Certified Equine Specialist, a natural lifemanship trauma-focused EAP trainer and certified practitioner and has over 5,000 hours working with clients with equine assisted therapy. She is also the author of multiple books. Her husband's an Air Force veteran and they founded Heart of Horse Sense, whose mission is to support veterans and first responders overcome the impact of trauma through equine assisted therapy and learning. Without further ado, Shannon, I'll let you take it away. Hey everybody, and thanks so much for having me. I look forward to sharing what horses do and how they help. Uh, I've been in this field for more than 30 years, and I'm convinced that my mom still doesn't know what I do. So you're not alone if you are like, what happens with equine therapy? So of the two faces that I can see, have either one of you ever done any of the equine therapy? Okay, that's a no. Yes, I got a yes over there from Deborah. Um, okay, and Virginia, you've done it as well. Awesome. Marilyn and April, if you want to chat, uh, chime in on uh, the chat, you're more than welcome uh, yeah, you've done it as well. Okay, so good deal. And April is our last holdout. Well, I'm glad that you guys have had experiences with it. And I don't know, as I was saying uh, earlier when I was talking with Melissa that, oh, you haven't done it, Gloria. Okay. Um, I was talking to Melissa that not all horse programs are created equal. So I am going to be talking about like my piece of the elephant because there's so much that can be done with horses. Um, and your experience may have been very different. My goal is to connect you up with a horse program near you, wherever you are. So at the end of the call, Melissa is going to give information about how to connect with me. And I will try and find a program that suits you, uh, whatever it is that you want to do. Cause there's a couple of different ways. I mean, horses are good at all of this stuff. Um, how we frame it is what matters. What's different. 
So I have a little uh, presentation that we tend to give at the beginning of immersion retreats here at the farm. Uh, when we do them, we do immersion retreats that are multi-day events where folks are staying on site and really immersed and all that sort of stuff. So, and we talk about uh, horses for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let me know if you can see. Let me get everything just right. So let's make it do what I want it to do, which is always questionable. As I said to Melissa, if it has four legs and hair, I'm in business. Uh, and if it doesn't, then um, I'm going to struggle just a little bit. So I'm not able, there we go. That's what I want. All right, then. So you guys, can you see the screen? And it should yes. say how, how horses heal trauma. All right. Awesome. So there's a lot of different ways that people talk about this work. They'll either use the term equine assisted. They'll use equine facilitated. They'll use equine guided. The horse doesn't care what we call it, right? It's really about the practitioner and their training. Uh, horses help is the short version. And they can be used, used in the idea of doing more learning focused stuff and doing straight up therapy, like counseling, like psychotherapy. Uh, so the courses span the gamut. We're gonna talk just briefly at start about how horses heal trauma, right? And we'll talk about horses for a reason, a season and a lifetime. And I'll tell little stories about the pictures of the horses. We have a program called the Wild Bunch and the Wild Bunch is where we take horses with um, less than nurturing backgrounds, horses that have been beaten with a two by four, have been traditionally broken, right? And have uh, had the effects of being broken, you know, as they say in the horse world, uh, have impacted their mental health. And so we take those horses and we retrain them. And we often have our veterans retrain the horses as part of uh, the program as well. So this particular girl here, this horse, uh, she had never been touched um, by a human. Uh, she Humans were good for dispensing food and nothing else. Um, so she this was her first contact and we managed to get a picture of her first contact. So we had a rope around her neck um, to help her understand some of the cues that we were giving her, but that rope slips off pretty easily and uh, she actually initiated this contact. So Wild Bunch is a lot of fun and working with wild and rescued horses is a lot of what we want to do here. So short version, here's the science. I got to geek out on the science just a little bit. So what when we play with horses, all of these parts of our brain are engaged, right? Brainstem, diencephalon, limbic cortex. So from the bottom up and from the top down, that's why working with horses is more effective, I would say, than sitting in an office with even the best therapist in the whole world answering how that makes you feel. Because answering that question means nine chances out of 10, you're coming just from the cortex, right? And if the cort if the bottom, the brainstem ain't regulated, then what's getting up to the cortex is very, very small. So this diagram, a model of the brain, comes from an excellent book that is really, really uh, layman's, uh, easy to read science. Um, it's uh, Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry have a book called What Happened to You, right? So as opposed to what's wrong with you, which is the way a lot of people ask the quote, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? Uh, a wiser and uh, smarter question is to ask what happened to you, right? So this is that diagram. I'm going to go a little bit faster through some of these. Uh, the short version instead of the four part brain is regulate, relate, reason. So if you're not regulated, if you don't have shelter, if you don't have food, if you don't have a modicum of comfort and safety, then relationships don't matter, right? Relationships fall away. So unless we're regulated, we can't worry about relationship. And if we can't, uh, if we can't do both of those, then we can't get up into reasoning. So we use things like sensory input, movement, relational interactions, and thinking in rhythmic, patterned, repetitive ways, right, to reorganize traumatized brains. 
So think about being at a barn and having one hand on a horse while the other hand is grooming, right? That is generally a rhythmic patterned, repetitive sensory input, right? It's rhythmic pattern, repetitive movement. When I'm listening to the horse's feedback about being groomed, then I'm in a relational interaction, right? So we're lighting up all of the brain when we're playing with horses, which is why equine therapy can be so effective in a shorter period of time in healing trauma, right? And I will say healing trauma without ever having to talk about it, right? And that's a lot of times what uh, brings people to our farm is I'm just not going to talk about it. I don't care what, I, you know, I understand I'm supposed to talk about it and that you want me to talk about it, but talking about it has not helped. So that's one thing. If you have a therapist that says you absolutely 100% must talk about it, get another therapist because you don't, right? So uh, this over here on the right, and you can look at this when you get the presentation later, is some of the things that we actually do to regulate the brain stem, to regulate the diencephalon, to regulate the limbic system, and to regulate the neocortex. So this is the brain science part. But what matters is these are some of the top experts in trauma in the country, Frank Putnam, Bessel van der Kolk, Bruce Perry. So uh, trauma is, and certain kinds of trauma, trauma disorders, um, are a state change disorder, right? So my state, my resting state has changed from one way of being to another way of being, right? At the core of traumatic stress is a breakdown in the capacity to regulate internal states. So I like I liken that to, I cannot shift. I am stuck in low or I'm stuck in high. I've got no reverse and I've got no three right? I cannot, I cannot, I can no longer have control over what shift, what, you know, gear I'm in. And that's what trauma does, right? That's what prolonged chronic trauma does. And those states become traits over certain periods of time, right? And that's usually what we're dealing with when we're responding to trauma and diagnosis of PTS, PTSD, however you want to phrase it. So, all the brain science is over with. So if you're if you're scared of brain science, yeah, that we, you're done. You don't have to do anymore. Um, now to the good part, right? So why horses? Why not cows? Why not dogs? Why not chickens? Why not any of these other critters? And I'll say that all these other critters are great critters, right? There's nothing wrong with animal therapy. How we interact with horses is different. So horses have brains that have evolved to ensure survival just like us, right? And just like chickens and dogs, and right? So, but the way in which they survive as prey animals, survival is the part of the brain that's activated or engaged most of the time, right? Most of the time, survival is the overriding concern for horses, which is very, very similar to the human with a trauma, a trauma background, right? Uh, much of the horse's brain is paying attention to the environment, right? You know, a, a situational awareness, what's going on around them. Uh, and then they make decisions about how to respond. Horses are the original trauma brain, right? That's the way that we talk about it. So rather than uh, learning in a therapy session about how trauma impacts the human brain, we're able to look at it outside of ourselves and see how horses respond, right? In real time. See, the cool thing about horses is every time you drive by a pasture and you see horses, so just because they're in the survival part of their brain most of the time, they're not running for their lives all the time. Most of the time they're chilling in the pasture eating grass. I mean, notice this the next time you drive by a horse pasture, they're generally not running for their lives. So how does it happen? that they know that they're safe enough to be able to eat grass, right? And by eating grass, they're putting their head down and they're limiting their field of vision, right? So you know that a horse that's eating is to some degree okay with its safety, right? Or that has its head down. So these are among the reasons why we work with horses. Horses, and this is one of my favorite uh, cartoons, you know, horses, are huge animals. And yet 
there's not a horse person in the world that doesn't have a story about a plastic bag flapping down the highway or flapping across the barn, terrorizing a horse, right? And there's a really good reason for a plastic bag to terrify a horse. Number one, it's not a natural sound. It is not, it is a man-made sound. It is artificial as can be. So that in and of itself is enough to throw them into a state of alarm, right? Uh, the other reason why it might throw them into a freak out stage uh, state is it has occasionally the sound of fire. If you rustle a plastic bag together, it can sound a little bit like fire licking. And that's a sound they really need to know about, right? So this is a, a horse joke, you know, when horses, uh, Halloween movies for horses. So this is the, the comeback. It's like, okay, Karen, time to see just how scary a random plastic bag can be. It's all about context, right? And I love the cat sitting on her lap. Do it, do it, right? So it's all about context and it's all about what you're expecting. Um, so back to a little bit of brain science. Uh, so the plastic bag, here's how we do what we do. So the plastic bag startles me or the car backfire or whatever the too many people in my in environment uh, are startling me and triggering me, right? So the brain will activate a state of alarm right? Hormones are released that send us into fight or flight. My neural network, how my brain has developed will determine what happens next. If A, if I do not have the pathways from the lower regions of my brain to the upper regions of my brain well-developed, right? Then I'm going to go into fight or flight, right? Those, those are going to be my best options is to go into fight or flight. If, uh, B, if, if my pathways to the neocortex are established, then in 22 one hundredths of a second, I can go, oh, not going to kill me. I can return to a state of calm or alert, right? Or C, if I have learned adaptive coping mechanisms to stress, i.e. pathways to my brain allow me to dissociate, I ignore and freeze. So obviously A and C are no good, but they're pretty darn normal if we don't have the pathways in the brain developed. Now, everything that I'm saying is true of humans is true of horses too. So we get horses that come in, in these, you know, beaten with a two by four, neglected, never been touched, have really good reason to not trust people. So we're helping them recover from precisely the same state that the horses are helping people recover from, right? And that's the beauty of this. Like 25 years ago, when I started this program, I wanted it to be good for the horses and good for the people. There's a lot of programs out there, in my opinion, that'll sacrifice the horse for the good of the human, which is not a healthy relationship, in my opinion, right? It's got to be good for both of us, or it's not good for either of us eventually, right? So, it's a puddle, it's water, it's what you drink every day. And of course the horse is like, I think I see a shark, right? The horse is wired to pay attention to anything that will threaten its survival. And yet we have horses that are jumping over, you know, doing steeplechase races and jumping over all kinds of high jumps and water. How does it happen? Well, it happens slowly through developing the neural networks in the brain, right? And that rhythmic pattern, repetitive, sensory input, movement, relational interaction, and then up into the cortex, the thinking part, is how we do what we do, right? All right, so what does all that mean? Well, uh, I've got some pictures here and some ideas about how it works and how it can work. So we talk about horses for a reason, a season, and a lifetime. Most of the folks that come to our farm are coming for a reason or a season. The reason is usually life sucks. I can't get out of the house. My kids are going to kill me. My wife is going to leave me. My husband's going to leave me, right? I need to do some work and I don't want to do it in an office. I've tried to do it in an office and it's not working for me, right? So folks will come to us for individual therapy and there are lots of programs around the country 
that have grant funding through the um, VA Adaptive Sports Grant, through Wounded Warrior Project, through lots of different organizations where that those services are available free of charge, right? Um, after doing reams of paperwork, of course, because it's the government and you can't do anything without reams of paperwork and intakes and measurements and stuff like that. So uh, these are some of the photos that we have of some of our veterans. We have permission for all of these veterans from all of these veterans to to take these pictures. The one that I will draw your attention to, obviously, is the um, uh, female marine. The horse that she's with was attacked by a mountain lion. And that horse, uh, I was at the grocery store one day and the kid at the checkout counter saw my t-shirt and said, can you help my horse? And I said, I don't know. Um, but the vet, the farrier, everyone in her life was telling her that she needed to put this horse down, right? That he was unsalvageable. He was dangerous. And she said, can you help him? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, so my husband and I went over to meet this horse and he was definitely very, very high end trauma, right? He was responding with teeth and with feet to every overture, to every contact. But we could see that inside all of that protection was a horse that could get along, right? He was not irrecoverable. And I believe that's true of people too. No one is irrecoverable. It's just about how long the work's going to have to happen. So we took him. Um, we knew that he was tough and he was probably going to hurt somebody if he wasn't in the right hands. And that's kind of what we do. So we brought him to our farm and he has been with us ever since. He is not ever going to be any 10 year old girl's backyard yard horse, right? It's not going to be his, his way, but he works with a couple of clients, not a lot, but a couple, but he works with this particular Marine. And anytime uh, she's, she's done a lot of work with him to help him through his issues. And he's done a lot of work with her <laughs> to help her through the various things. So um, she's, she's just a, she's a really special lady and the horse is a really special horse. And this is the, the way it works is that it's good for the horse. It's good for the human and mutual healing occurs. Some of our other veterans that you can see, obviously it's about the relationship more than it is anything else. It's not about riding. It's not about, you know, for us in individual therapy, it's about the relationship. We believe that if we can help people build healthy, connected relationships on demand, that you will be able to insulate yourself against the things that are bound to happen to disrupt your life, right? There's no getting around things like that happening, but it's the relationships that we have and those relationships don't have to be with people either. They can be relationships with uh, the, your environment, with nature, with horses, with dogs, with cats, whatever. It could also be your relationship with yourself, right? Because a lot of times trauma fractures my relationship with myself more than anything. Like the one person I should be able to count on, I can't count on because my track record proves I can't count on me, right? Talk about fracture to get reconnected to your own self is no small task, right? So uh, just some of the pictures of the farm, the natural environment doesn't suck either, right? So the natural environment is a lot of what happens when folks go on outward bound uh, adventures, when they do different things in the, out, in the wilderness, right? Um, there is this rhythmic pattern and repetitive sensory input that comes to us from the natural environment. And that I believe is a lot of what people experience as the healing power of nature. And blessedly what we do is in the middle of nature. So sometimes people come to us for a season, right? It may be a year, it may be a couple of years, it may be a semester, it may be an eight week group or whatever it is. And through group learning or group therapy, folks, um, build relationships with horses. They build relationships with each other, right? So we run various things like eight week groups. And again, these eight week groups exist around the country um, and are at no charge to veterans. Um, again, remember, I'll be able to connect you up with other programs that actually are military um, competent and working with military, not just 
believe me, there's plenty of programs out there that really, really, really want to help. And they can sometimes, without proper training and education, do more harm than good. Um, if I had a dollar for everyone who wanted to come to my farm and watch that magic happen with veterans and horses, I wouldn't have to fundraise. But it's not appropriate for everybody out there to just throw in. I, I don't think. I believe harm can be done if you don't understand, if you're not military, cultural competency, right? If you don't understand trauma, if you don't understand certain things, uh, you can actually do harm. So that doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that they need more training and, and education. It's not as easy as it looks. So uh, our programs here, and there are programs all around the country that do straight up horsemanship, right? So that's teaching people to barrel race and to rope and to uh, go on trail rides and to do dressage and jump and all that kind of stuff. So learning about horses and doing something super fun with horses in somewhat of a competitive environment. They're great programs that do that all around the country. Um, other programs like ours and around the country also integrate wild horses or horses that have been abused and neglected into their veterans programs. So we call it our wild bunch. Um, and then we also have straight up eight week group learning and group therapy type programs. So these are some of our programs, uh, photos from some of our retreats. We'll do um, immersions and I'll talk about that in a minute. But again, notice that at least at our program, there's not a lot of pictures of people on horseback, right? A true healthy relationship will allow the horse to say no if the horse wants to say no. You know, just because I want in the age of me too, we all know that uh, no means something, right? We all know that no mean or should mean something, right? Whether it was respected or not. So the horse gets a vote and the human gets a vote. And if the horse says no, then that's the, the vote we go with, right? So most of our relationship building happens on the ground because getting on the back of a horse is a fairly vulnerable place to be, right? The horse can hurt you and you can hurt the horse, whether you think you can or not, right? So we want that decision to be really thought well thought out and uh, and everyone to have a voice in it. Because if I get my way at your expense, it's not a good thing. I'm not learning good relationship skills. Right? <laughs> We've all been in that relationship at one point or another, and it's no fun. Right? So uh, lifetime. Once, If horses make all the difference, if horses really get it done for you, um, the veteran that you see on the spotted horse with the POW MIA flag um, came to us uh, from... Uh, uh, from a treatment center uh, about 10 years ago. And he thought he was going to be doing dogs and veterans. And then he got into horses and he was like, uh Oh, this is it. And he became a peer support specialist. He became a horse professional. He's been, he's a, now a horse owner and he's managing a barn down the road. He also works here at our program alongside me and my husband um, when we go out into the community and when we're seeing veterans, right. When we're working with veterans and, doing individual therapy or group therapy. So you can get into it for a lifetime and you don't have to. Most of the folks that come to our farm are never going to hang out with horses again after they leave the farm. And that's okay. But I want programs like this to exist all around the country so that veterans don't have to drive three hours or five hours or 10 hours to get to a program like this. This should be something that is readily, I believe, accessible no matter where you are in the country. I get a little soapboxy, I get a little carried away. I had to take a sip of water. Uh, so some of our um, programs out here, uh, we have a couple of miniature horses and there's a lot of fun in working with the miniatures because people think because they're small, they're easy to boss around. And if you've ever had a little dog, you know better, right? Uh, but it's awful fun uh, to have uh, someone think because they're small, they can get bossed around and then the minis show them what's what. Um, we're learning how to tie a rope halters in that other picture. And then the picture of the little gray horse approaching, uh, that's my husband, the Air Force vet. Uh, she was another one that was very, very badly treated. And uh, um, just to see that moment when the horse breaks open really and gives you that moment of trust and reaches out to connect is a really, really big moment. I mean, we've had plenty of folks here who've worked with these horses 
And yes, um, we can tie them up and rope them to the ground and we can make them take what we're doing. And until they volunteer it, it's it's all about force, fear, and intimidation. And force, fear, and intimidation is not good relationship material, right? It's just not. Uh, so all of the training methods that we use here uh, is based on um, what we say, love, language, and leadership in equal doses. So too much love, you get, you know, love for the carrots, love for the apples, love for the sugar. And when the treats are gone, so's the horse. That's not a good relationship. Uh, too much leadership, too big a stick, too much force, right? That's not a relationship either. We want to be somewhere in the middle, some, you know, equal doses of love, language, and leadership. We got to learn their language. So individual therapy, we do something called Fall and Fridays. More programs around the country have studied with us and trained with us and are doing Fall and Fridays, which is just a free walk-on group from like 10 to 1130 on Fridays here. And we're based out in Western North Carolina. So we're at the Asheville VA. That's our primary VA that we're partnering with. But like I said, we've been training programs around the world, actually, uh, on the programs that we offer. So more and more programs are offering something that's just a free drop-in, walk-on group. You don't have to pick up a 500-pound phone and ask for help or make an appointment or you know talk to anybody or anything before showing up and finding out if we're nuts, right? I mean, because that's really what people are you know, like I've heard this horse thing, I've heard that it's helpful, but I can't imagine what they could possibly do out there that would be helpful. So uh, we do fall in Fridays, we offer horsemanship, we have volunteering, um, we do immersions here and the flyer that Melissa is going to be sending out to you has some of our immersion dates uh, for the this year. Um, we'd love to have you here. We don't pay for transportation, but we pay for everything else once you get here. Um, and we'd love to have you. And the immersions are at the moment, they're two full days, uh, sunrise to sunset horses. And you do all of these different things, right? Because there's no one way that works for everyone. Some people want to do horsemanship. Some people want to do individual therapy. There's just no one right way. So we want to give a sampling of all the different things that you can do. Uh, to get a hold of us, you can email veterans at horsesenseotc.com. And OTC stands for Up the Carolinas. So we're in North Carolina out by Asheville. Um, and thank you. Thanks for being a part of this. I point out, I love this photo because this was one of our veterans immersion retreats. And that particular horse was hogtied and whipped when he was a year old. And for the next 10 years, no one could touch him. 10 years, no one could touch them, right? They finally got tired of feeding a horse they couldn't touch. They called the rescue and they uh, said, if you can catch them, you can have them. And so we went and got them and we brought them to our farm. And I tell you, for the first two or three years that that horse was on our farm, neither my husband nor I could predictably and reliably halter this horse or touch him, really. Now, 10 years later, he, I could talk anyone on this call through approaching him, connecting with him, haltering him and going for a walk with him. So recovery from whatever is possible. It's the timeline that matters, right? The timeline is out of our control. We may have agendas and ideas about how fast this needs to happen or when it should be done, et cetera, et cetera. But the timeline is in charge for us is the horse's job. We know the destination. The horse knows the timeline. When we're doing therapy, we know the destination and the client's in charge of the timeline. And we're going to take what it, you know, take the time it takes and eventually it'll take less time. So um, that's a little bit of the, uh, what happens here. And I've noticed a couple questions. Let me get out of stop. Let me get out of sharing here. Um, and I know that Melissa has been uh, paying attention to those questions for me. So I am open and ready for questions. So the first one is um, asking what documentation is required for a referral? Uh, so none, you can self-refer to almost every program. Um, there are some programs, especially the ones that I've mentioned, mentioned that are grant funded uh, that may require uh, a diagnosis of PTS, PTSD um, in order to be completely eligible for the grant funding. Um, 
most programs will accept self-referral. So you pick up the phone and call, you send an email, uh, and it goes from there. For us, we have a short kind of uh, uh, questionnaire that just gives us things like, you know, name and where you're from and what branch and you know, the the basics. And we ask things like food allergies. So if you're coming to one of our things, we're going to be cooking for you and we got to know that stuff. Other programs may have different intake procedures, but most of them accept self-referrals. Oh. Melissa, does that get it? Yes. Hope you have another um it's a lot of uh what a sweet picture relationship. What a great program. Thank you for doing this for horses and for veterans. Amazing recovery story for both the horse and the veteran. Yeah. Excellent book. Oh, another one. I'm afraid of horses. Do you have any smaller animals? Well, so whether you're afraid of horses or not, we're gonna be working with the horses. Right. So it's not a program for people who love horses or even think they like them. One of the populations that we started working with when we first opened this business, because it is technically a business, although it's, you know, um, we started working with gang involved and incarcerated youth. And they didn't have the hots for horses. They're not like, ooh, horses are cool and beautiful. Right. They didn't give a hoot about horses. And they were pretty afraid of them too but they wouldn't show it, right? Because they had to be tough. They had to be, you know, all puffed up because uh, they couldn't show weakness at the lockdown facility that they were in. So a lot of our work with people who are afraid of horses is first off, thank you for telling the truth. It's not easy to tell the truth about something like that, especially in a lot of environments. Um, and I guarantee that there are ways that we can work with that fear and this horse in ways that'll serve you and anyone later on, right? So um, what I say is, if you're not a little bit afraid, you're not paying attention, right? Because horses are large thousand pound prey animals. So a, a, a reasonable amount of fear is appropriate. If it stops you from doing that which you want to do, that's where we're going to really start to intervene. And we're not going to say, just do it or get on over there. It'll be good for you or promise you that the horse is never going to hurt you because all of that is not true, right? You're the best judge of your own safety, not me. I can't keep you safe here or anywhere else. You can do that when you have the right tools. So we would definitely, we could start with the minis, right? If that felt safer, and then we'd work our way up maybe to some of the bigger horses on the farm. And we'd really go, if we're doing therapy, we're going to go at your pace, right? You know, we're in charge of the goal. You're in charge of the timeline. What we talk about when we talk about fear is move closer, stay longer. I'm going to move just a little bit closer than I did last time. And I'm going to stay just a little bit longer. And then I'm going to rock back into my comfort zone. Right. If we stay in the comfort zone 24 seven, no change happens when we get to the edge of the comfort zone and we move a little closer and stay a little longer. That's where we start to really expand our window of tolerance. And really, that's where the answer is being comfortable or at least moderately comfortable with difficult situations. Right. So so that would be not my not very short answer to could we start with smaller animals? Yes. And I would want to get to the point where you would determine how far and how long, but keep pushing the envelope just a little bit until you could tolerate a little bit more. Does that make sense? It's a great question. And we, like I said, I mean, even our gang involved toughies, you know, that they're like, I'm not scared. You know, I'm not scared. I'm not going anywhere near this horse, but I'm not scared. Well, it, you know, it makes sense. First and foremost, it makes sense. And we don't let fear keep us from doing the thing uh, that, that scares us. I see. You see the chat, Shannon? Oh yeah, I just pulled it up. I'm okay. sorry. I was I was waiting on you to cue. Okay. 
uh, documentation required, a freight of horses, great program, horses for dummies. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm going to point people specifically in the direction of what is called natural horsemanship, because normal horsemanship is all about breaking horses, and I don't want to break horses, right? I don't, I don't want to start them, and I want to give them a future. I don't want to break them. So being aware of that. Um, I still don't like getting on alpha males after two years. Tell me more about that. I think I know what you're saying, but what, what, what's that, Marilyn? Oh, bi uh, bigger and more dominant. Yeah, yeah. And I would want to play with that horse on the ground and figure out why dominant and what the dominance is um, uh, attempting to cover, right? Because chances are, I, I got to tell you, some the biggest horses on my farm are the horses that are the most sensitive, but they've learned how to BS their way into pushing everyone else around, right? Um, so one of the first things that happens when horses come to our farm is we start asking them questions, lots and lots of questions so that we can find out who they really are underneath all the BS presentation that they've either been trained to give or had to give to survive, right? Usually it's one of those two things. And so I remember we got this one horse and he was, he was used to being a show pony. He was used to you know, being in shows and being told what to do and when to do it and how to feel about doing it and when to quit doing it. And I mean, he was just used to being ordered his entire life. And when we first started asking him questions and he got that we were asking him questions, he was like, who are you, who, who are you talking to? Because no one has ever talked to me. They've never asked my opinion about what we're doing. And it was so nice to see his eyes light up. Like, hey, wait a minute, this is a place where I actually can be heard, right? Um, that's a really cool moment when a horse feels comfortable enough to be able to talk. At, and I, you know, I use a lot of language that people go, what are you talking about? Horses don't talk, but they do, right? It's not about the, the salesmanship out there is about horse whispering. And it's not about talking or whispering at all. It's about listening. Listening is where it's at. And when you listen really, really, really well to yourself, to your horses, to the people in your life, to your environment, right? Then you can catch the danger in the environment and you can get ahead of it and you can know when you need to leave and you can know when you need to go out and you can know all of these different kinds of things. I, I love my job. Can you tell, right? Um, so it's about listening. And so, yeah, I don't like to get on alpha. I won't get on a horse that I, 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 I don't get on a lot of horses. I will spend a ton of time on the ground finding out their personality long before I'll get on their back. Because when I get on their back, they have the ability to hurt me. And I don't like getting hurt. I don't bounce like I used to when I was 10, right? When I was 10, I bounced a lot more. I don't bounce anymore. So I'm not going to get on that more dominant horse because dominance is not the way to build healthy, connected relationships. It works. Force, fear, and intimidation work. We know that, right? But it's not a way to build a relationship. So I had a uh, a Navy SEAL call one time uh, and say, you know, I know the mission first, bootstraps, get the job done. I know that lecture. I don't know what to say to my 15-year-old daughter when her boyfriend has broken up with her. And I'm like, I know, Right. Where's the training for that? Where's the emotional training for how to be connected and in relationship with another human being? That's not what we get trained for. We get trained to do lots and lots of other things. And we're supposed to just figure this stuff out. Um, and we can't figure out what, you know, a lot of us didn't get, right? That's not, that's not how I was raised, right? <laughs> so, so I hope that gets to your question, Marilyn. I wouldn't get on that horse either. Um, but I would be asking lots of questions around how do we how do we create an environment where dominance is not the answer, right? Dominance works, but it's no way to build a relationship.
What else? What else? Looks like that's everything in the chat. Okay. So tell me about some of the programs that y'all have been with horses. Where have y'all been and what you've been doing? I, I guess I'll go first. My name is Virginia. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. I went yeah. to a retreat in Marble Falls. Okay. And it was good. Um, it was after I... I I do the animal rescue for the felines. I got to do three dogs, foster failed my third dog. <laughs> so I decided he, he had more um, social issues and anxiety problems than I did. So yeah. he, um, he pretty much stayed with us. We don't have children yep. and we were concerned about him, you know, maybe snapping at a child. And yeah, so, fair enough. Yeah, so we he wasn't really a fan of the cats. Um and we lost him recently. It was um it, it I took it pretty hard. Um but we went through again, we don't know what all he had been through before he came to us. He was terrified getting in yeah. the car, um, terrified of the TV, just terrified. Yeah. And uh yeah. we went through six weeks of puppy training and then another six weeks of obedience training that the rescue paid for um, because we were just trying to get him out of the shelter. He had been, I think he had yeah. a little bit of a, uh, what is that? A cage crazy. Yeah. And they've, yep, yep. they've just been in the cages way too long. It was a smaller shelter. I don't think they got a lot of support. So, right. you know, it was just a, a difficult, very difficult situation. And um, after that, shortly after that, I went to Marble Falls for their, their horse retreat right. for about three or four, well, actually, I think it was just a weekend yeah. and, um, and they had us kind of do the obedient, like, you know, maintain the confidence in yourself, you know, and have right. the horse follow you and things like that. I don't, right. we did not ride the horses whatsoever. I mean, it was yeah. incredible. It was yeah. a, an incredible weekend. Um, and even though I'm in Texas, we really don't get that much exposure um, yeah. to horses being in the city. Yeah. So we did help. Actually, we had a horse rescue. We did help. Um, people were dumping uh, cats on their farm. And so we went out there and did a lot of trap neuter and return yeah. so yeah. they could concentrate on the horses. <laughs> so we uh, had well, it's one rescue. Thing. Yeah, um, we had one rescue trying to help another rescue. So yeah, it kind enough. of yeah, it, we were trying to kind of help each other a little bit. So that that's well, kind that's of been my exposure. Way. Yeah, that's the best way. And and uh, Marilyn, I see your comment in here. And I, I want to respond to, I think it's just hard to pretend you're not afraid when you still are. And I would say it's never about pretending to be something that you're not, right? Um, and horses don't care if you're afraid. They care if you lie about being afraid. If you're pretending not to be afraid, that's when it matters to them, right? So we have lots of folks, when they tell the truth about being afraid of horses, then the horses are cool with it, right? It's when we lie and we're so good at lying because it's the way that we keep ourselves safe out there in humanville, right? All people are not equal. All people, it's not okay to take the armor off around, right? We keep the armor on because it keeps us safe. But living in armor 24-7 is no way to live, right? So who's it safe to take the armor off around? How do I know they're safe to take the armor off around? And how do I put it the heck back on? Because going out into the universe all kumbaya is a way to get hurt, right? So horses don't care how you feel. They care when you lie about how you're feeling or you pretend not to feel how you're feeling. So every, I agree. Um, it's, it is hard to pretend that you're not afraid when you still are, which is why we don't ask people to do it. Right. Tell the, tr you know, tell the truth about how you're feeling, do only what you can and not what you can't ignore all that. Just do it, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. No, no, that is your internal alarm system telling you something useful. Now it may be a little oversensitive, right? It may be set too high. And that's maybe what we want to tweak a bit is how to dial that a bit. But uh, your internal alarm systems are the most important thing to keeping you safe. 
And we don't want you to override that in any way, shape or form, right? So, so anyhow, sorry, I just had to share that because we get a lot of people who are like, well, the horse is going to, you know, I'm just going to pretend I'm not afraid. No, no, don't do that. Tell the truth because the horse knows anyhow, because when you pretend not to show up the way you're actually feeling, the horse knows you don't know your own mind and therefore you can't be trusted. You won't be trusted because you don't know your own mind. Right. So, um, sorry, I, can, I love my job. What can I say? Hi, I, I can go ahead and talk about my experience since we're doing sure. that. I'd love to hear. I hope, I hope you don't have a horrible horse experience. <laughs> no, I mean, I think part of the problem is I had a traumatic experience when I was about at eight with a horse. So right. I've always kind of been afraid of horses, but yep. then, then when the Healing with Horses Ranch in Maynard, Texas, right. uh, offered, you know, this program, I said, well, I need to learn to deal with this fear. And yep. I've been working with them for like a couple of years now, and it's taking, you know, it's a slow, long process. Yep. But once I get used to, like, I have this certain horse that I work with mostly. Yeah. I don't have as much fear with her now, <laughs> yeah. but still every now and then I have to ride a new horse that I don't really know. Yeah. And um, that can be hard. And they do, yeah. they, they do seem to encourage me to, you know, make my posture so that it's more like I'm not afraid. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> and yeah. um, and just to um, show my leadership or some such. But we've been working our way up and now we're to the point where we're even trying to do archery from the horse as it's moving. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> so it's it's definitely interesting. And I have, you know, been building my stamina and not being as fearful. So I think it's working. <laughs> Well, good. I'm glad you've had a good experience and I'm glad you're sticking with it. And one of our uh, training leaders uh, says, take the time it takes and it'll take less time. So take the time it takes and it, it, there's no there's no timeline, right? You get to decide the timeline about when things happen um, and don't accept anybody's outside opinion about what they think should be happening for you, right? So you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the voice that matters, no one else. Yeah, and I am somewhat empathic so I can feel most I guess all of these horses have been traumatized so they also you know have issues and yeah yeah and, and I so would argue I that almost any horse that has been traditionally trained has been traumatized to some degree my mm -hmm. definition of a rescue rehab horse is quite broad my definition of a, a traumatized human is also quite broad I mean even parents with the best of intentions did harm and damage right? And they didn't do it intentionally. They didn't do it maliciously, but stuff happened, right? And uh, it can be really challenging to get through some of those things. So thanks for speaking up, Marilyn, and I'm glad you're involved in a program there. You're welcome. What other questions or observations? Other, I know several of you have also been a part of programs. Have you been doing, it sounds like most folks have been doing more horsemanship type stuff and less of the straight up therapy type stuff. Is that true? Okay. Gloria, what you've been up to with horses? Is it hard to start a program? I, so Gloria, while you're figuring out the mute button, is it hard to start a program? Uh, it's not hard to start one. It's hard to keep one. Um, you know, if I had, yeah, it's not, it's, it's hard to keep one going. If you're interested in retiring to Tahiti on your salary, you're in the wrong field. I'm just going to say, so don't, if you're in it for that, don't get in it. <laughs> but if you're in it to make a difference for horses and humans, um, and you're not worried about a paycheck, then um, it's it uh, it's absolutely worth it. Gloria, did you get it? Oh, okay. You um, can can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I've only done traditional therapy. Um, okay. I just found I just moved to South Carolina less than a year ago, and okay. um, I was actually in Kentucky before that. Where you think there's a lot of horses, but uh, but yep. um, 
I never heard that they had these kind of programs before. Nobody ever told me about these before. So when I came here and I was doing something with the Women's Alliance, the Veterans Alliance, that's right. when I first heard about it. And that's when I said, oh, I need to see about doing that because the other stuff, the, the, like you like you said before, going in and speaking about it and talking to people doesn't always seem to work. So maybe yeah. I need to try something different because it's been a lot, lot, number of years and uh, I still have some issues. So I'm hoping maybe this will be something. And I, I actually love horses. So I used to love to go riding horses when I could. I was a city person, but we used to get to go ride horses periodically. And and okay. so I, when I heard this, I thought, oh, I love, I love horses. I need to find out about this program. Where in South Carolina are you? I'm in Somerville, um, just north of Charleston. I'm about four oh, okay. hours from Asheville. Okay, okay. Only because well, my also... daughter-in-law is from Asheville, so that's how I know how far it is. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, there's us, and then there's a program just outside of Charleston called LEAP, L-E-A-P. Okay. Uh, it's low Country Equine Assisted Psychotherapy. Um, okay. And I connect you up with them, um, or you can come here. Our, our Fall in Friday is the first and third Friday of every month. Um, and every other, uh, every other week, uh, uh, that Marine that I showed you in the picture, uh, he has his own program now while he also works with us and he has a warrior Wednesday program. So every week he's either doing warrior Wednesday or we're doing fall and Friday. So there's always some free walk-on program for veterans, uh, somewhere. Okay. Is, is our- there going to be, is there going to be another place I'll be able to get that information from? Cause I'm not going to remember all that. Oh yeah. No, you, you mean you're not, how are you not going to remember? Of course you're not going to remember. I had traumatic Um, brain injury, so that doesn't help me remember either. (laughs) Oh no, I was just giving you, uh, giving you trouble. (laughs) Um, Melissa has it. She has my contact information and you can email me. Um, anybody who wants to be on our mailing list for, uh, our veterans programs can just email me, uh, at that email address. Um, and, uh, I think the QR code in our flyer isn't for whatever reason, wasn't working. We're trying to get it fixed. So, but you can go to the website. It's pretty easy. Um, and my information is, uh, it, it, Melissa has it all and can get it to you. And okay, if thanks. we're not convenient, we can get you connected with that low country F1 assisted psychotherapy. They're doing great work, really nice work. I can offer another suggestion as well. Uh-huh. Um, I go to, sometimes I go to these female veteran retreats at the Omega Institute in New York. Yes. And, and they frequently will have like a field trip out to an equine therapy place. Yep. And so it's really a nice program that they have. Yep. Yep. Can I uh, chime in here? Yeah, please. I've been fortunate and blessed, I guess I could say, to to be a horse owner for over 40 years. Yeah, yeah. One or many. I uh, worked with military youth programs for yep. age. Um, I was a director for military child and youth programs, so I got stuck with 4-H. But I didn't really get involved with the therapy aspect until after I was deployed to Iraq. Yeah. And came, came back home. Uh, I was in Arizona at the time, and I moved to Maine and went to, uh, using my veterans benefits, got a degree in uh, recreational therapy. Nice. And while I was doing that, because of my love for horses, I did my final um, internship. I created an eight-week program um, with veterans at a program called Healing Through Horses in New Gloucester, Maine, and uh, I was horses there. And then I got involved with another program, a lady, her name is Nina Fuller, who did a equine psychotherapy and mixed yeah. it up with photography. Yeah, I know Nina. I tra- actually, she went to Prescott College and I used to teach at yes. Prescott. Yes, well, she actually used my horse, Howdy, in, in her um, her final her final <laughs> paper. Uh, Howdy passed away. Uh, actually, when we were doing a workshop, I, he had broken my leg and we didn't know he had an EPM. So I had to put him down. And he's actually at Nina's Nina's farm right now, buried looking out. But anyway, um, so I still have two horses. I just moved down to Tennessee. Oh, OK. And what part? I was I'm in Speedwell. OK, not, where's that? Speedwell's not too far from Harrogate or the Cumberland uh, Gap. Plateau? Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. OK. Yeah, not far then. I found a program in Lenoir City called Star. 
Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've sort of started working with them. Okay. But uh, it's really kind of ironic. So I moved down to Tennessee and all of these years have been working with horses and know how, how they reflect all of your feelings. And I'm, um, now that I'm retired, I'm, I'm being um, treated for anxiety. Yep. And it's so funny. So the horses I've got, they feel it. And, you know, oh, I, yeah. yeah. So the horses that I had in Maine that, you know, I was nice and reliable. And now they're, they're looking at me like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, what's wrong yeah. with you? Yeah. So it's helping me uh, with my own horses because yeah. I'm kind of using my own my own guidance to, to figure out how to, how to work with myself. Yeah. Well, I mean, horses are nothing if not honest. I mean, my horse can tell me things that no human can right? Yep. They can tell me the truth about things and I can hear it from them when I can't hear it from people because people have agendas and they have, uh, you know, there's all that stuff about being a human. When a horse tells me that I need to check myself and go back to, you know, turn around and come back, that's different feedback than if a person were to say the exact same thing. It really, yep. it's just different because they're not going off of any of this stuff. They don't care how much your tennis shoes cost, what you do for a living. You know, they don't care about any of the stuff that people care about or tend to privilege. They're just going off of who you really are inside. And that's the feedback that I need because I'm really good at the performance and I'm really good at, you know, the, the shields um, and getting real and getting down into the, the deep part um, can be hard, right? And my horse will go, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't you come at me with that surface stuff show yeah, up or don't show up at all right traditionally as soon as you pick up the lead rope they can feel it it's like the it's like yeah. a, a nerve you yep. can feel how calm you are or how screwed up you are just through that lead rope yep. and it, yeah it's amazing well thank you guys i have a client coming up and i need to get out and get ready for it but um thanks for having me and thanks for all the conversation it's nice to meet all y'all thank you so much shannon